um, I don't know if you want to, we told her she's going to open Q&A, so yeah. just start. Yeah, I Give guess if you actually wouldn't mind saying your name and what outlet you're from again before you ask your question, that'd be great. Other than that, just fire away. So I'll go first. I'm Jake, and I'm just with the school, so I'll shoot me a pen with all of it. Um, my name is Shelby. I'm with the Odyssey Journal. Um, can you maybe just talk to me a little bit about your new movie that's coming out and the or, or that debuted in November and kind of the importance of what that lifetime document or de you know show was about and how it's important in today's day today's age. Yeah. So for years I've been asked about doing a movie or a documentary, and I always said no because it's it's really scary to come out and say. This is everything that happened to me. Well, it's one thing even to say it, but then to try to portray it on a screen for everyone to watch, to try to feel those same emotions that I felt while I was being kidnapped, that's really scary. And how could anyone ever do that justice? How could everyone, anyone ever portray it 100% accurately? I just never really felt like that I could trust my life to someone else to portray that. So when I was initially approached, I kept saying no, thank you, but no, thank you, but no, that's so nice of you, but no. Um, but this, these individuals that approached me, they were very persistent at it, and every time they met with me, they kept saying, well, Elizabeth, you know, we don't just want to do your story. We don't just want you to sign off on it and say, okay, go do it. We want you to be involved. We want you to be as involved with it as you can stand to be involved. And uh, so that got me started thinking and then they sent me some of their work over, and that got me thinking a little bit more. And then as I continued speaking and meeting with other survivors and other victims, I couldn't help but realize, well, not even realize, I've known this for a long time. I guess it just kind of made it more poignant at that moment that there are so many people out there who have survived something similar to me. Because realistically, what happened to me is not that unique. Kidnapping happens every single day. Rape happens every single day. Sexual violence happens every single day. And bringing that all back up into my mind and realizing just how common it really is made me feel like maybe I should do this because this is an opportunity to hopefully give viewers an opportunity to understand what it is like to go through that. And when they find out that maybe a friend or a family member has been raped or has been sexually exploited in some manner, they're not the ones asking those dumb questions like, well, why didn't you try to get away? Why didn't you do more? Because so often when a victim hears the words, why didn't you, they actually hear, you should have. And they're already feeling, well, I already survived this huge, whole, terrible thing, and now you're saying I should have done more? So um, I just felt like it was a another opportunity for me to answer more questions, um, give people who, who don't understand what it's like an opportunity to see what it's like and to hopefully feel what it's like. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Sydney Jensen, I'm with BYU-Idaho Radio. Uh, in, in recent light of uh, lots of just allegations and just uh, lots of larger circles, if you will, of sexual harassment and things like that, what is one thing that you would recommend that people can start doing, be it in their own communities, in their own homes, to essentially kind of combat this culture of sexual violence, if you will? Well, sexual violence is kind of one of those taboo topics that hasn't, up until recently, has been very hard to address um, in homes, in families, in communities. It's just been one of those kind of topics where someone says, well, I was raped, and everyone stops, has that awkward moment, and it's like, okay, what's next? They don't really know what to do about it. And today, as we are hearing more and more, all of these allegations of sexual violence, all of these uh, women coming forward, and, and not even just women, men too, um, coming forward and talking about how they've been sexually assaulted, we are in a moment that, I mean, this is... This is huge, this is so important, and we can't allow this just to disappear and melt away like it has 
basically every time in the past. This is an opportunity for us to bring these conversations into our home, to start having these conversations with kids about, and of course, make it age, age appropriate, but talking about what's okay, what's not okay, talking about what rape is, um, what abuse is, uh, where they can turn to help. I, I always talk about the three things I think are most important for any parent to share with their kid is first of all that they're loved unconditionally and make sure that the child understands what unconditionally means. Second of all is that no one has the right to hurt you or threaten you or scare you in any way and it doesn't matter who that person is. It doesn't matter if it's a family member, a friend, a religious leader, a community leader. It doesn't matter who it is. They don't have that right. And thirdly, if someone does hurt you, if someone does scare you, then, then they need to tell you and they need they need to know that you have their back, that you will believe them. I can't tell you the number of victims I have met over the years who, who have told me that they didn't tell their parents because they didn't want their parents to get hurt. Um, they didn't want their parents to stop loving them. They were scared that they were going to destroy their family. Well, that is not a responsibility that any child should have to worry about. All the child should be worrying about is that their family is going to be there to back them up and support them. Um, so those are very, some very simple conversation starters you can have in the home right now. Perfect. Thank you, um, Rachel yeah. from uh, SC6. Um, so I wanted to ask you, why do you think it's important to talk about what happened to you, and especially to a group of college students like you will be today? And what do you want them to take away from what you have to say? Well, first of all, I'm so excited to be here and to hear about this campaign that they are pushing forward. It's so important, especially at the university level where there's a lot of students away from home for the first time and they're kind of out on their own. And I think the urge for all of us to be accepted is probably one of the strongest urges we will have as human beings. And just how far do we allow our need for acceptance um, to go before we're actually getting hurt? I, I'll never forget, a few years ago, I was interviewing a couple young women who had since graduated from college, but both of them, their freshman year, had been raped brutally by, one was a boyfriend, the other one was just a friend, an acquaintance, a friend of a friend. And neither one of them at the time really understood what had happened to them was rape. It actually took, it was years later before, I believe it was a police officer that came and told them, no, what happened to you is rape, and that's not okay. And that has stuck with me forever after, and I think it's so important that, you know, we, we call rape what it is. I mean, rape can come from a boyfriend, it can come from a husband, it can, I mean, and it's not just, you know, it's going to come from men. I mean, women can do it too. Men certainly do get raped as well, um, but it can come from a spouse, a significant other, it can come from someone you know, someone you don't know. Unfortunately, statistically, uh, most sexual violence that does happen, most rape that does happen, comes from someone you know. It's The exception is the stranger, and so that's why I feel like it is so important. So we can, so I can share my story. So first of all, all those victims, because whenever I speak and I look out at the audience, I know I'm not the only one in the room who's been raped. I know I'm not the only one in the room who's been abused. And I want them to know that they're not alone. I want them to know that they are not responsible for what happened. They should not feel guilt or shame over what's happened to them. That was not their fault. There's no situation in which rape or sexual violence will ever be acceptable, ever. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're a prostitute and you sell sex for a living, or if you're a 14-year-old girl kidnapped out of your bed in the middle of the night and are raped. Neither situation is okay. So I want them to know it's not their fault, and I want them to know that there is still hope. There is always hope that you can move on. And this, this terrible thing that has happened, it doesn't have to define you. It may shape you, it may mold you, but ultimately you define who you are. Um, yes, and then you. <laughs> Misty, local ABC and CBS affiliates. So Time Magazine recently just named their person of the year actually as the hashtag MeToo campaign in honor of all those who have spoken out against sexual violence, sexual assault. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's great. I think the hashtag MeToo movement has been huge. I think it's great. I think now more than ever before, I think... 
survivors are starting to feel more of a camaraderie and feeling that maybe they can't put their face to what's happened to them yet, but they're able to have an outlet for it in some form, which I think is very empowering. I think it is part of the healing process. I think bottling it up and pretending like it never happens, I don't think that helps anyone. So I, I think it's huge. I think um, we're seeing some real progress in an area that has not seen progress for a long time. Yes. Natalia Hepworth with EastEndingNews.com. In the, this new digital age and with the use of social media applications, what would be your recommendations to young men and women uh, in order to stay safe if they're probably misusing a social media application? That used to be a pretty easy question to answer because usually families just had one computer and you could say, oh, put it out in a public area, have your filters on it, but now everyone has a handheld computer. Everyone has, kids have computers. There's so many apps I haven't even heard of before and I don't feel like I'm that old, but I, it's hard to know. It's hard to say. I don't, I don't think I even have the answer yet. Um, I, I would say don't give your address out, um, try to keep your security settings up high. Um, I wish I had better answers. Maybe ask me again down the road and I'll have a better answer for you once I know the answer because I'm not sure that, what that is yet. Is there a part of your experience that's particularly difficult for you to speak about? Well, when I first started speaking, I was I was petrified. I was so scared. I was so nervous. Um, and I remember getting up on stage and I had this big notebook full of notes and, and I was so worried that I was going to miss something that was important. And I just remember being very, very scared because not only was I on stage in, in front of an audience of, I don't know, a couple hundred people, but I was sharing the most intimate parts of my life, the worst parts of my life, and that was, that was terrifying. But as I started to do it more and more, and I started to see things happen because I started sharing my story, I became more confident, and I realized that I have control over what I share. So now I only share those things that I feel comfortable sharing. Yes? I have another quick question. What message do you have for young men who may be surviving? First of all, I want them to know that they are so strong for surviving. And I want that every survivor to know that they're strong for surviving. Surviving, the word survivor to me, it doesn't mean weak. It doesn't mean less than. It doesn't mean tainted in any way. To me, when I hear the word survivor, I think of strong. So I want them to know that they're strong. And I want them to know that what's happened to them is not their fault. And I want them to know that it doesn't make them any less of a man. It doesn't make them any less, I don't know, macho, if you will. That's a terrible word to describe it, but I can't think of any other word off the top of my mind. And I want them to know that uh, there is no shame in coming out and speaking about what's happened to them. And that actually, in my opinion, that only shows strength because... There is this stigma that to be a man, you know, you have to be so manly and, you know, you're the protector and you're the strong one and these kinds of things don't happen to you. But to step forward and admit that something has happened like, like rape or sexual assault, that, that takes an even greater courage and even greater strength. So I want, I mean, I want them to know that this in no way diminishes them in, well, in, in any way. And I want them to know that we need, we need more men to come forward and talk about what's happened because we're seeing so many more women come forward, which is huge. And they're, they're bringing together this camaraderie where it's becoming a safer place for women to come forward and talk about what's happened. But it's still one of those taboos for a man to come forward and say that they were sexually abused. So don't, let's change that as well. Yes. Sure. Shelby with the ISJ. Um, as, a, as a person who, like, speaks about their experience, I'm sure that that's a way that, that has helped you kind of deal with it or cope with it or, or, you know, 
throughout the years kind of compound, compound analyze or, or deal with it in some ways. But, you know, and there's other individuals like, so coming out uh, or, or like, you know, explaining the situation to somebody, in your case, it's a little different, but for somebody who's encountering sexual assault, coming out is one part of the equation. And then dealing with it afterwards, you know, once it's kind of out of the bag, I mean, with the spectacle involved in your case, it's a little different, but can you maybe draw some parallels with people who go and get counseling, you know, or, or, and then like motivational speaking, like what's the importance of seeking help or, or counseling or, or dealing with, you know, sexual assault or something like this after it happens? In my experience of speaking and, and traveling and working with survivors and working with different organizations, I found that sexual assault and, and rape in particular, it is a crime that in many regards is worse than murder because you keep living and you keep feeling those feelings and there's I don't think there is a one size fits all magic formula that's gonna make everything better um, I can't say oh you know therapy twice a week like sitting down with a psychiatrist twice a week plus medication is gonna make a happy life now that absolutely may work for some people, but I just don't think there's a one-size-fits-all, and I think you do have to find what works for you. Now that therapy comes in different forms, you know, maybe it is sitting down with a counselor, maybe it is um, writing in a journal, maybe it is um, equine therapy, or, uh, I mean, there's so many different forms of therapy today, one of the many forms out there. Uh, maybe it's music, I don't know, but you have to find what's right for you because by holding it inside, I've found that only tends to eat more and more and more at your soul until you're just constantly filled with this feelings of darkness, feelings of guilt, feelings of shame, feelings of, well, of filth, of, of worthlessness, of the worst feelings as a human being you can possibly feel, and, and no human deserves to feel that way, um, no survivor victim deserves to feel that way and so I would say find your outlet find your therapy whatever that may be you know maybe it is speaking to a counselor maybe it is um, composing music maybe it is I don't know but find it because holding it inside of you is stealing your life away from you and after surviving something as terrible as, as rape you don't deserve any more of your life stolen away from you. Thank you. Yes. For maybe people who aren't necessarily a survivor, they've never gone through something as horrific as rape or sexual assault or domestic abuse, but they know someone that uh, has or someone comes to them and decides to confide in them and say, this is what's happened, what's the best way for them to either respond or prepare maybe now for when and if that happens to them one day so they can respond appropriately. Be a support. Stay the friend to them that you always have been. Don't don't change your friendship because of what they've told you. Don't change your relationship with them because of what they've told you. They obviously told you because they felt like you were a safe person to tell. They trust you. Don't do something to lose that trust. Be there for them as a support and if they need help in going to the police be there for them. Go with them to the police station. If they need help in finding a counselor, be with them. Go to your local advocacy center, whatever it may be. Be that friend that you would want someone to be to you if you came and told them. We have time for one more question. <clears throat> well, I have a quick question. Do you have any connection or ties to Idaho? Um, well. I know. That's... Now let me think just a minute. I'm pretty sure I had some ancestors that lived in this area. Um, oh, actually, my uncle and I had some cousins that lived up in um, hang on. I, it was Idaho. can't think of where it's isn't that sad? Um, like northern Idaho? No, no, it's like right across the border from Utah. Uh, I want to say... Preston? Well, yep. 
Breast. Oh wait, yeah. She's Breast. My hometown. Yep. <laughs> I have some cousins that live there. Cool. Well, thank you. Any last-minute questions? I think that wraps it up. Thank you, Elizabeth. Great. Thanks.